Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. In this midweek release... You'll hear our conversation with Yafa, a Palestinian poet, author, and activist living in the diaspora, about two recent collections published by the trans and queer Muslim publishing house that she helped found called Mirage. One of the two books is entitled Inara, Light to Queer and Trans-Palestinian Utopia. The second is a collection of her own poems written during the last lunar eclipse visible on Turtle Island entitled Blood Orange. We spoke about the importance of poetry and world building, the importance of community care and mutual aid, as well as supporting queer and trans Palestinians escaping genocide at the hands of the Israeli military. You can find more from Mirage Publishing, as well as how to obtain these titles at merajpublishing.com. Enjoy. Yeah, hi. Uh, first off, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Yafa. Uh, they, them, or they, she pronouns. I'm the current executive director of the Muslim Alliance for Sexual and Gender Diversity, which is one of the largest queer and trans Muslim orgs. Uh, I'm also a queer and trans Palestinian. Uh, so a lot of my work over the last seven and a half months has revolved around supporting queer and trans Palestinians and other queer and trans folks who are most impacted by genocide. I'm also a writer and a poet. Uh, with my collection Blood Orange was published in November, talking about the events of October 7th specifically. And then I just uh, finished editing an anthology uh, called Inara, Light of Utopia, uh, that encompasses 18 queer and trans Palestinians from around the world, some in Palestine, uh, some elsewhere, specifically to envision a free Palestine. How are you doing right now? I'm doing all right. It was a busy night, which happens sometimes with time difference. But I am glad that I got to sleep in, and that was really wonderful. I haven't slept in this late in months, <laughs> and so it was it was really nice. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yes, yeah, sleep is so important and such a precious resource sometimes. So you mentioned a few of your projects. Among other things, you founded the Mirage Publis- Publishing House, which earlier this month launched its second book, Inara, Light to a Queer and Trans-Palestinian Utopia. Congratulations, first and foremost. Can you talk a little bit about your publishing house and about this most recent work, who contributed and what readers will find? Yeah, absolutely. So Madash Publishing is something I've had on my mind for the last couple of years. There are so many gaps that currently exist within queer and trans Muslim organizing in particular. And when I say Muslim, whether it's for the nonprofit, whether it's for any publishing things, we're talking about people who are racial, racialized as Muslim. So we're not talking about the belief system per se, we're talking about the racialization of that identity. Uh, and so over the last several years, there's been a few different pockets that I really wanted to try to address uh, within queer and trans Muslim organizing. Uh, again, because our infrastructure is so like there's very little resources that um, that go to, to to individuals who are racialized in, as Muslim and are queer and trans for a, for various reasons. For listeners, probably most of them are going to be really obvious, right? We're kind of an invisible population, uh, and so we kind of have to build out our own infrastructure. Otherwise, no one's going to build it for us. And so, over the last couple of years, one thing I've been really reflecting on is how literature is world building. So everything that we're currently experiencing in the world has already been written about. And same with like the concept of Zionism, for example, it was written about in literature for a hundred years before it became a political philosophy. And so I think I've been thinking of that over the last several years in terms of whose stories get to be shared and who gets to make the decisions about which stories get to be shared. And I often will give an example of if I went to a traditional publisher and said that my Muslim family uh, are transphobic and that my Palestinian family is queerphobic and uh, I want to write about that, they will give me a six-figure deal instantaneously. But if I go to them and I'm like, actually, yeah, like I pray five times a day and my dad goes to the mosque five times a day and my mom knows the whole Quran and like, and we're really cute and my parents don't understand why the rest of you are a mess. 
nothing, right? They will definitely not give me anything and not because it won't sell, but because they know that that's the world it will be building. And so I've been thinking about that over the last couple of years. And my plan was actually to, once I leave Meshit, the organization I currently run of really launching Madaj Publishing uh, and giving that the time and attention that it needs. But when October 7th happened, um, you know, especially that first week of realizing of like, there wasn't a single, there wasn't a single queer trans Palestinian that I could think about who was writing about the genocide, right? And where my experiences would be shared and where the experiences of other queer and trans Palestinians could be shared uh, and centered in the ways that they need to. Uh, and so it was just one of those things where it was like, all right, I guess now, now is the time we're doing this this week. <laughs> And so it ended up launching very quickly. And so the short-term vision for Madaj is really to be publishing a little bit more of anthologies. So we have a new anthology that we're actually going to be announcing in the next couple of weeks, and that will be released later in the year. We just launched Inara, which has 17 other queer and trans Palestinians who are a part of it. And these queer and trans Palestinians are across various age groups, various countries, various parts of the diaspora, some still in Palestine, some in the surrounding region, some in what's known as the United States and Canada. And it was really just a space for people to explore what a free Palestine looks and feels like. And one thing that we were really, really critical about with the, with the process is when we wanted it to feel utopic for everyone involved. So it wasn't a matter of like, let's stress you out in trying to envision a free Palestine. To me, that defeats the purpose. And so in terms of like equitable pay, in terms of access to resources, in terms of access to support, the process looked incredibly different from one person to the other. And because of that, it allowed us to really allow people to do what they wanted. And so it's a collection of some poetry, some short stories, some essays, some photographs, some digital art in a way that usually you wouldn't see anthologies done. And so, for example, every single piece has a digital art piece associated with it that people are able to access through a QR code. One of the pieces, which was written by this incredible queer Palestinian who's also dyslexic, you know, as they were working through it, it was like, well, like, why don't we just re-envision what it would look like for someone dyslexic to be writing something? Uh, and I will say if probably half the contributors are dyslexic, right? And so kind of reimagining what that process needs to look like instead of being like, this is the only way you need to write it. And so even in like one case, a person sent me voice notes and then those voice notes were the things that were transcribed and then that was edited instead of being like you have to do it in this way and only writers writers are only this or that and so it was it was really beautiful and so for the for the short term we'll be doing a little bit more of anthologies as well as releasing my own work i have another collection that comes out june 19th called desecrated poppies that i haven't mm -hmm. announced yet Mostly just because I haven't had time to announce things. <laughs> so it's less of like, oh, we're waiting until this date. No, no. <laughs> I just haven't had time to announce it. But I'm really excited for that book as well. I wasn't intending on publishing a new poetry and essay collection, but this collection is specifically around anti-transness, anti-Palestine, and the rise of fascism, which couldn't wait until October. Initially, the plan was to release something in October, but you know, with us going into Pride in a week and a half, and with the right and, and we know they're going to hit us really hard in the coming week with with a ton of anti-trans legislation as they usually do towards the end of the may legislative session in what's known as the united states and so really wanted to have a book that goes into that a little bit in a way that unfortunately i haven't necessarily seen a lot of people go go into mm, that sounds like such a beautiful anthology i'm really really excited to to read it and to like delve into it a little bit more, especially since it seems like a multimedia kind of like mm. re-envisioning of like the form. Are you yourself uh, personally a poet? You're a yes. poet, right? How can you talk about like, how did you come to poetry as an art form, as a form of self-expression and as a form of um, resistance? Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of interesting because I actually used to write novels for a really long time. So I, since 13, I would say I've been writing one novel a year. It started just being really, really bored in math class and then wanting to run away and make money that way and 
you know, here we are. Um, now I'm 31. But so for, for years, I would write young adult fantasy and sci-fi. And it was kind of my way of just escaping from different realities. And, you know, I've lived in like nine different countries. I've lived in a dozen states in what's known as, as the United States. I've lived in a lot of places. And as you can probably imagine, as a queer and trans Palestinian Muslim person who's also disabled and is a global South citizen instead of a global North citizen, mm. you know, very few communities can hold <laughs> even half of what I am, let alone the the entire thing. And so writing has always been my way moving through processing things. Poetry was actually really interesting because poetry was actually just the last couple of years mm. since I got back to the U.S. after living in Ireland for a couple of years during COVID. Mm. And I was the caretaker for one of the people I grew up with, one of my really good friends at the time who had stage four cancer. And so her cancer metastasized that summer. And so I moved to the Bay Area to kind of take care of her. And I started writing poetry for the first time. Mm. And... The thing with poetry, and Audre Lorde kind of talks about this, is that it's it's the most accessible form of writing because you can do it anywhere. And so it would literally just be on my phone as we're at like different appointments, right? As we're in transit, as I'm waiting for different things. And it was just a lot easier to to kind of like to be able to grasp instead of writing like a full novel and trying to have continuity and plot and things like that. Poetry is just whatever you want it to be. Poetry is just, poetry is like literal chaos and I love it. <laughs> And, and in my opinion, all poetry is always perfect, which also helps. And so, but that was kind of how I started the more of the, of the poetry journey. And there were so many times and spaces that I would just be writing poetry. Um, so much so that in the, the year prior to October 7th, I had written like seven poetry collections just because there was so much happening, right? So much happening in the world, so much happening in general, but also I, I finally had time. And this was after I was no longer the caretaker over like the the, the year, uh, well, not year, maybe like eight months prior to October 7th. And so when, when October 7th happened, you know, and wanting a, a pathway to center queer and trans Palestinians, poetry just made a lot of sense. Uh, and it was really interesting because whether poetry or novels, I actually have rarely been able to write about Palestine. So Palestine has kind of been the one area where it's like, whoa, <laughs> like there will be a little bit like here and there, but it would be like almost like excruciating to bring it out. But after October 7th, I think especially with envisioning of Blood Orange and being like, okay, this is now needed. It was one of the easiest things to write. And it was written over Eclipse Weekend in October. So October 13th to the 15th. So 28 out of those 32 poems were written that weekend. And they just flowed. They just needed to be out there. And so really grateful that, you know, discovered poetry a couple of years ago. And it became one of my accessible formats. And yeah, I wholeheartedly enjoy it. I still write other things. So I have other works. It just the poetry to me is still the most accessible. And uh, and I will say of like, especially like right now, and I have this conversation sometimes with other people of, you know, right now we're also activated because of everything happening in the world. And so for me personally, I actually haven't been able to read any books except for like poetry books. Like that's the only thing I could like be able to try to process. <laughs> um, and so I do think that there is a lot of power in in having multiple like modalities and formats to make it as accessible as possible to people uh, in different ways. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that's really beautiful. There's so much there, but I would I would love to ask about so we learned that the proceeds from the book sales are going to Palestinian families escaping Rafah into Egypt. Can you talk about this and the groups that you're hooked up with on the ground doing this work? Yeah, absolutely. And so it's actually really specifically queer and trans Palestinians and their families from Nova, which which is a very, very, very specific type of work. So yeah, so when when I decided to do Blood Orange, I decided to do Blood Orange for two different reasons. One was to center queer and trans Palestinian experience as we're going through this, knowing that that's not something that's going to be centered easily within mainstream society. And then the second reason was knowing that, unfortunately, no one was going to be providing resources and assistance for queer and trans Palestinians specifically on the ground. I always ask people, like, how often, like, 
if people have heard of a single person who's queer in Gaza, and I always ask them if they've talked about pinkwashing in the vast majority of places, especially queer and trans spaces, they've talked about pinkwashing, but they're so removed from the situation on the ground that they actually don't know a single name. They don't know a single person who's been killed. And so knowing that, um, basically all of the profits from Blood Orange were going to queer and trans Palestinians on the ground in Gaza. And that was partially for evacuations, partially for food, partially for tents, whatever was really needed for the queer and trans Palestinians uh, I work with. And from there, it kind of shifted into creating a second mutual aid group as well, and then a third and then a fourth, because the the second, so the, the queer and trans Palestinian uh, support work is usually a lot of the events that I go around and the, the different talks that I do, the fundraising, all of that goes to queer and trans Palestinians on the ground. But realizing of that queer and trans Palestinians and other folks impacted by genocide in the diaspora are just as vulnerable in different ways. They're getting fired. They're getting, they're getting evicted. They're losing ch their children, right? Like they're getting doxxed. All of these things are happening. So then created a second fund and that fund is a, is a separate fundraiser. And I actually work with various funders to move money through that. And that's kind of become the larger one. So we've probably moved close to like $70,000 on the ground in Gaza over 120 for people in the diaspora. And then I have another fund that's for psychosocial support. So if someone is in need of therapy, I will go and pay a therapist to, to, to be working with them. And then the last one is for frontline organizers, which is also a very niche need. But in terms of where the fundraising for these events goes, for the money on the ground, from the very beginning, I try to be like really, really, really specific with people because I think people here mutual aid to a space and they already imagine an existing structure of how that looks like and and that like i can go and give you a name of a person that that money is going to go to when i wouldn't give names right because it's queer and trans people right and so like that's a very vulnerable population in different ways but the the other thing that i think most people don't understand about not even just genocide but it was the same for for working with different war zones but within genocide I can go and fundraise for somebody. I can go and some fundraise for this very, very specific person to get them out of Rafah. So I would need $5,000 at least, right, to be able to get them into Egypt. I'll be really honest, the amount of times that by the time I have that money, that person is already killed. Mm. And that's a reality that I think a lot of times people don't think about when it comes to genocide, right? It just, you know, I'm fundraising for this family. And so the money is definitely going to this family. And it's like, we don't, we don't know that. <laughs> and I know I probably, and I, I really want this to no longer be the case at some point, but I think I probably know the most names of queer and trans Palestinians who have been killed in Gaza out of anybody on this planet, potentially. Mm -hmm. I know over three dozen and it, I don't know many people who know more than a couple, even within this work, unfortunately. But And so the money goes to where it's needed most for queer and trans Palestinians on the ground. I will say the needs are so, so, so large that even unfortunately with people being killed, that it's not as if like we're running out of queer and trans Palestinians. And so the vast majority of that 70K that has been raised, and most of that is through Blood Orange and Inara, uh, mostly Blood Orange. Blood Orange has sold over 3,500 copies, which is amazing for a poetry book. Like that doesn't normally happen. Even with, with more established traditional publishers, poetry is kind of the place where no one makes money. <laughs> And so, but so, so most of the 70 has, has been through that. And most of that has been through evacuating different individuals and have been able to, able to evacuate a decent amount of people, which is really, really wonderful. But as listeners might know of, you know, it's, it's one thing to evacuate a single person. It's another to evacuate an entire family. And so I will support with like coordination and things like that for the, like the rest of the families, but to try to get money for, like a queer person and their entire family, like we're looking at like a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars, and you know, unfortunately, seven and a half months later, I'm still basically the main person fundraising for queer and trans Palestinians. So, have been able to raise over like two hundred thousand dollars total between the different funds, 
And also we know that's like a drop in a bucket when it comes to evacuations. So yeah, so this money will will go towards that. Right now though, I will also say of Rafah is fully closed, right? Like the border is fully occupied. And so uh, still supporting the people who have been able to leave, still supporting people on the ground for like their more urgent needs. But there's a big question mark in terms of when evacuations will restart again. What do those look like? And so when that happens, we will pivot again and again and again and just support whoever we're able to and the most marginalized in that moment and and try to get aid to them. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for your point about the concept of mutual aid, like not being a static organization based thing sometimes. And I think that like the point is is very, very well made and like well received, you know, like I think that perhaps it's something to think about more for listeners. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any more that you want to say about that? Like mutual aid is a a concept that's been bandied about quite a lot and like maybe in certain circles has like somewhat lost its teeth, but in this context maybe has not yet. Yeah. So one, one thing I've been going, but part of what I share with communities when I go and visit communities and have these conversations is for individuals living in what's known as the United States or what's known as Canada or any part of the settler colonial world is that this year in particular in what's known as the United States is going to be a really vicious year. And we've known that for a really long time, right? We know that the elections are coming up in November, but beyond that, like we know that the far right and uh, white Christian nationalists are weaponizing trans identity in particular to really move us towards fascism. And there's debates about like, how deep into fascism are we? And in my opinion, we're not fully there yet, which is why I talk about these things. And if we do get to a place where we are fully ingrained in fascism, then there's a very, very different way of moving. But whether we're there or not, things like community care are essential across the board. And so I've been telling communities of, you know, we, we we need funds in in Palestine. We need we need to be I, in my work. Great. Right? I need to be able to get queer and trans Palestinians out. I need to get them resources on the ground. I need to do a lot of different things. And also for me, none of that means anything if the communities here who are trying to do that work are fully struggling, disposed of, and potentially dying in the process. Mm-hmm. And and so I encourage communities to really reflect on what does community care look like within their communities. So I have the different funds, but you know, if someone is calling in from is is wants to message me from Asheville, a queer and trans person who's impacted by the genocides from Asheville, you know, I normally live in Oakland. And so to me, I'm like, it doesn't make sense for someone from Asheville to have to reach out to someone in Oakland for support. I will provide that support. I will make it happen. But I want community care and mutual aid built out in Asheville. I want it built out in Durham. I want it built out in New York. I want it built out in DC. I want it built out in every single city because we're going to need it everywhere. And mutual aid is interesting in in what's known as the US because it's always existed very invisibly within the most marginalized of marginalized communities. And then it rose to prominence during COVID. And there's a lot that we can learn from 2020 as we're in 2024, because 2020 was also an election year. And the thing that fully, 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 fully destroyed COVID, uh, destroyed mutual aid, not destroyed COVID, still here, destroyed mutual aid was actually the election. There were a lot of things that were creating fractures that were allowing it to begin to crumble in different ways. But the end of it was Biden winning. Because Biden winning allowed the predominantly like white liberal majority to be like, oh, we're saved, we're good to go, and pulled out all resources, right? So foundations stopped funding it, individuals stopped funding it, it it just disappeared. And that was really sad to witness in a lot of ways. But also, again, I think there's a lot that we can learn from it of what's going to happen this year or what's possible this year. And this year, we're a lot closer to fascism than we were in 2020. There's a lot that are way worse than where we were in 2020. And so I invite communities to do this now. Like, this is the time to do that. And by 
and when I say to go and do it, I don't mean if you have no idea what you're doing to go and start from step one and figure it out. We don't have time for a step-by-step -step process to figure this out. There are people in every single community who have been doing community care forever. It's existed within different communities forever. Go and learn from those communities, right? Ask individuals outside of your community for support. We need to be able to mobilize this as quickly as possible, but this is going to just be rising. And if folks have been paying attention to the last seven and a half months of the people who were most engaged in the beginning are no longer engaged, right? Burnout is very real. Mm -hmm. Disposability is very real within communities and, and, and movement spaces and state violence is very real. Right. And which is why we're seeing that the state is starting to charge more people with felonies, right? Instead of just regular misdemeanors and things like that. And that's because once you have a felony, you're out of organizing space, right? Your risk is so much higher. The resources that we need to utilize to support you are so much higher. And they know that, right? And so, again, this is why community care is needed literally not even today, like decades ago, but like it's needed today, it's needed tomorrow, it's needed next week. So whenever you get to this, build your own community care platforms and, and foundations within your communities because it will be needed. And what happens if fascism fully, fully, fully rises and we end up in a fully, fully, fully authoritarian state is that the community care just becomes invisible, but it still exists. You actually don't have to shift that much of it but it definitely would have to become more invisible. And even today with like this in-between state that we're in, the vast majority of my community care work is invisible. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that I will like share about, but I will also do work in very, very, very specific ways to the point of existing structures would, would think that I'm doing it wrong, right? Because like, I will never name anyone. I am the only person who will know names and like, if something happens to me, I have a process in place of how people are going to be taken care of, right? But most of it is invisible. There's the visible piece of like, we need money, <laughs> but like, but everything else is, is incredibly invisible in terms of who I work with, how I work with them, all of those different things. And that's necessary within a society that's really close to fascism. You can't just go, I can't just go and be like, here's a list of everyone I work with. Like that's, <laughs> I, I'm not here to make it easier on the state. <laughs> and so, yeah, so I just want to invite communities to be at the forefront of doing that work for themselves as they think about doing it for elsewhere. Because if every community went and did that, then I can go and amplify my work <laughs> for everybody else. And then we'll have people taken care of. But right now nothing is taken care of, right? No one else is really supporting queer and trans Palestinians on the ground. No one else is really supporting queer and trans Palestinians and other identities most impacted by genocide in what's known as the US or what's known as Canada or other places, let alone anyone supporting queer and trans like Sudanese people in Sudan or queer and trans Congolese people in the Congo. And that's that's a part of like, that's where like my capacity does not reach. And so every once in a while, I'm able to support some mutual aid efforts in those places. You know, but I'm still one person for the most part. And I receive a lot of support, which communities are absolutely beautiful and wonderful and we love them. And it's still a lot on one person with, with, with just support versus all the communities kind of taking it upon themselves. Indeed. Yeah, I thank you for saying that. I also like have seen this sort of int renewed interest in mutual aid and community care organizing and... Well, also coupled with this sort of like um, uncertainty about where to start or uncertainty about how to go about it. And the the thing that I found most useful in in talking to folks about that is is just to like try and like combat perfectionism, because if you're doing it and you're doing it with sort of like the intention of having it build and having it be more complex and having it more like multifaceted, it will be okay. And it doesn't have to be perfect from the get-go, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, um, absolutely. And I will, just to add to that, I will say of like, so mutual aid and community care in particular have been something that the most marginalized of communities have always relied on. Mm -hmm. um, not because 
you know, it was a Tuesday and we thought it was nice to have, but because it was a Tuesday and we needed it to survive. And so there's a difference when it's those communities who have always known it are basically just given resources, right? And given platforms within the communities to be able to do this on a larger scale versus individuals whose survival is not tied to community care work. Mm -hmm. Everyone can be a part of community care work, but when your survival is not reliant on it, it's not, it's never going to be the same because it's always going to be this nice thing to have. And so it always means it's optional. Mm -hmm. It always means that on a Tuesday, I can actually step back and not tell anyone and never talk about this ever again. And it won't negatively impact my life. But when it's individuals who like, if you take a step back on a Tuesday, you know that immense harm is going to happen to your community. You're not going to take a step back on a Tuesday without being really intentional about it. And this isn't saying let's never take steps back. Steps back are beautiful. But like, for example, if today I decide I'm going to take a day off, I have a network of people that I will be reaching out to, to be like, hey, I'm taking today off. This is what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And I've cultivated that network to be able to be able to respond to that, where I could be like, and I need to raise a thousand dollars today. And they will go and raise a thousand dollars that day versus me just being like, okay, peace, y'all. <laughs> I'm tired. I am tired. I have been tired for a long time, right? But like, but me just dropping everything means my community dies, right? And that's not something I. It, it, to me, that's avoidable of that there's ways to, to to build this out. And again, the people who have been doing this, we we know how to do that. We have had to do that. Like I learned community care because like I was born a few months after my parents were displaced after the Gulf War. Mm -hmm. And so they literally packed up a ba like a sedan with like eight people, little clothes that they could carry and started immediately over. And then I was born a few months later. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was born into a community where if people didn't do meal trains and babysitting and housing support and just every single type of support, none of us would survive. And so to me, it's always been the norm. And there's there's a lot of people with those same experiences of that community care has always been our practice. It's always been our foundation. So my advice to communities is, that, especially if they're more privileged communities, support the individuals already doing this be a part of that don't necessarily start up your own thing as privileged folks because it's never going to be what we need it to be it's mm -hmm. it's going to be an additional nice thing to have but ultimately it won't know how to navigate fascism it won't know how to navigate state violence and state systems in the way that 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 we know how like i have 31 years of experience doing this work and I'm 31, right? And so like, <laughs> this isn't something that October 7th happened. And I was like, let me learn how to do this. It was, oh, okay, <laughs> we're doing this again <laughs> and again and again and again. Um, and so just putting that out there of, for folks who are interested in doing this work, of also just letting go of like, maybe it's not you who has to do this work, but maybe your power is that you have access to resources. You have access to space. You have access to money. You have access to different things. We need those things, right? Those are the things that slow everything down. Mm -hmm. And maybe you shouldn't necessarily be the decision maker of like, here's exactly how this is built out because you wouldn't necessarily know that. And that's okay. Like we love not knowing things. None of us need to know everything. It's actually really nice when I don't know things because then I don't have to do it. <laughs> um, but that's just me. <laughs> I resonate with that so much. <laughs> um so I have a couple of questions or just one question about poetry and one question about like logistics. How can people find more about you? Um, does that sound OK? That's perfect. Cool. So uh, our understanding is that poetry has been deeply intertwined with resistance in Palestinian culture in the homeland and in the diaspora. I was just uh, learning about the Tarwide, the songs that sung by women to their families mm -hmm. through the windows and prisons during the pre-Nakba period of the British mandate to deliver messages. Yeah. Would you speak about the power you find in poetry in sort of like a resistance or like continuity context? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question itself again? Yeah. Sorry. Will you speak about just the power of poetry in a, a resistance context? Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, resist uh, poetry as a form of resistance has always been a part of Palestinian resistance, and I will say of like it was always just a part of Palestinian life before the res resisting states was necessary in the way that it is. One really cool thing with poetry that that I that I find really really fascinating is that the continuity of poetry is that like you can take something that I've written and translate it into Arabic and just remove me as the author and take something else that was written in Arabic 60 years ago and also remove the author mm -hmm. um, or translate that into English. And, you know, unless you know very, very, very specific poet styles, you actually wouldn't necessarily, you wouldn't necessarily know which time frame it's from. And so it's a way that allows us to really bridge gaps between different generations. And to me, allows us to really better understand these systems, right? Of a lot of these systems have not necessarily changed. The tools themselves are the same. The visibility that we have to them is what's changed, but the tools themselves are very much the same. And so you can take things written tomorrow and compare it with 50 years ago, and it's you can't tell which one is which. Mm -hmm. And to me, that shows how simple and basic systems of repression are. Like I always tell people of like settler colonialism is actually basic. <laughs> like white supremacy is basic. <laughs> All these different systems are basic because the, it's always the exact same tools in the exact same ways. They have basically told us their exact blueprint and they usually do. Um, and so when we take a step back and we can just like reflect on that, I feel like we have everything that we need to really show up against these systems. And I feel like poetry is such a beautiful way to do that. It's mm -hmm. a, it's a pretty accessible form of writing. There's different types of, for, of, of poetry, right? That would be less accessible in the sense of like, you know, you have to follow certain formats, right? And it has to be like different things and different that and all that. And that's beautiful. But poetry is also just anything, right? I always tell people of like, have you texted before? You're a poet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care that you're not claiming that. It's you, you've written things, you're a poet. <laughs> Because poetry defies any logic, it defies any structure, it it just is. And I think that's absolutely necessary in any resistance movement is to find modalities that are fully accessible for everyone, right? Like not, every, not everyone could create a giant mural. I love that people can do that. Not everyone can, can make music. I love that some people can do that. Not everyone can write novels. I love that people can do that. Mm. Poetry though, for the most part, whether it's poetry in, as in like written or even like in storytelling and verbal like exchanges, poetry is almost accessible by everybody, mm. right? Not a hundred percent of people obviously, right? But like, but it's one of the most accessible forms of communication of, of archiving work, right? Mm. Of story sharing of all of these different things. And so, yeah, so I view like I don't think that you could have a resistance movement without poetry. Like, and maybe that poetry becomes into music, right? And it becomes into songs, right? And so I think of like how uh like specifically songs by like Aretha Franklin became like enormous during like the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. But lyrics are just poetry, <laughs> right? And and just different forms of it. And so I view poetry as such a beautiful tool that I view as essential for our movements. Uh, and this is where we also need to have conversations around how how many attacks are happening within like the education system, right, to prevent people from being able to access those types of things. You know, and one thing that is very different about Palestinians compared to a lot of other marginalized populations is that like in Gaza, I think the literacy rate is like 99%, right? And so we're talking about an accessible form of resistance that's accessible to 99% of people of a population. You know, that's obviously not the case for every marginalized group. And so we're able to kind of dig deeper and figure out like, what is it within other marginalized groups is going to be that form. But with Palestinians in particular, because literacy is so high, because the written form and storytelling, um, both written and verbal have been such a huge part of our practice for hundreds of years, poetry is, is just integral and has been um, for that entire time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for talking about that. What are your some up, upcoming tour dates that you have? Yeah. So um, 
I'm actually starting to go into my lust tour period. Mm. <laughs> uh, so I have uh, I have a couple events out in the Bay Area, one on uh, the 22nd, one on the 30th. I also have, uh, and this is part of why I'm not on the road as much, but I am partnering with a national art festival gallery where we are doing a giant memorial for Palestinians. So we're going to write a thousand names of family members of queer and trans Palestinians. So I've lost over 200 family members. I know others have lost similar or even more family members. Mm -hmm. And so we're writing down a thousand of those names. And then I will actually have a giant installation for a trans-Palestinian memorial. Um, and so it will be representative of the 13 trans-Palestinians that I know that have been killed in the last seven and a half months. And then represents all the other unnamed trans-Palestinians that potentially nobody on the planet knows. Uh, well, someone knows, but, you know, in, in accessible ways. Uh, and so the launch of that is going to be June 7th, and that's going to be a gallery that's available throughout the rest of the month of June in San Francisco. So if anyone's randomly there, they can come to the opening on the 7th, or they could just come and see it. It's at Soma Arts. Uh, and then doing a full day of workshops on June 16th, also in that same space to really uh, dig deeper. I'll also be in Salt Lake City June 8th and 9th. And then I will be ending the month with a week in Norway for Oslo Pride, doing a few events there. Uh, Oslo Pride has... And this was, they reached out months ago, but they have really been intentional about how to center queer and trans Palestinians throughout the process. How do they make sure that the work that they are doing is supporting queer and trans Palestinians? And so, so they are fundraising for queer and trans Palestinians organizations and for this work that we've talked about throughout Pride. So they've kind of integrated the two instead of the, the separation. And I haven't really seen that anywhere else, which Hopefully other places get it together and and move towards that with with their prides. But but yeah, so Norway is doing that. And then I'll be in Ireland, uh, both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic for a few different events there as well. Yeah. And then I will be taking a little bit of time off from touring. <laughs> Specifically because I expect to to need to tour more during the fall because we'll have the anniversary of October 7th and October. We'll have the elections in November. We'll have inauguration in January. It's going to be a lot. There will be a lot of needs for conversation to really try to figure out what happens next. Where do we go? Whatever ends up happening with any of those. And so uh, I will be taking it a little bit slower, but I will be having more virtual events throughout those months. Uh, so if people follow me on Instagram or uh, TikTok, it's uh, at Yafas Utopia, Y-A-F-F-A-S, uh, U-T-O-P-I-A. You'll receive all the updates over there. I will say of social media is shadow banning a lot of us. And so just make sure any queer trans Palestinians that you follow, just make sure that you're fully subscribed to them, that you're interacting with the things that that we say, just because otherwise you will miss it <laughs> because of how shadow banning is working. But yeah, so those are some of the things that I have coming up. Lovely. So you mentioned how people can follow you on social media. Does Mirage Publishing House have a website or a yeah. presence on social media? So Madaj Publishing also is on social media and it's just Madaj Publishing. We also have a website and you can sign up for our newsletter uh, where you will receive some updates. Uh, so it's just madajpublishing.com. Cool. And I'll link those in the show notes for sure. Amazing. Yafa, this is all the questions that I had that um, sadly I don't think we have time for anymore. But do you have anything that you'd like to add in closing or anything that we didn't get uh, to touch on? I think we covered mostly everything. I will say I just want to encourage people to go and follow queer and trans Palestinians who are specifically talking about queerness and transness as part of their foundation for the organizing work that we do. Trans people in general, and especially global majority trans folks, are going to be severely impacted over these next several months and years as we're in this fight. I think sometimes people forget that as we're fighting real people are being harmed in different ways. And so regardless of what happens months from now, regardless of what we're building out, people are still being harmed. And so getting as close to that as possible and making sure that we're listening to the people who are going to be the most impacted is really, really critical. Uh, the other thing I would mention is 
just about pride this year. So the FBI last week released a memo that basically said that pride this year is going to be targeted by foreign terrorist organizations more so than in previous years, which basically is just keywords for saying that pro-Palestinian organizations are going to be targeting pride. Because let's be honest, Pride has not been showing up for people impacted by genocide. It hasn't shown up for Black folks. It hasn't shown up for trans folks. It hasn't shown up for a lot of people. And so want to really highlight that as something to be paying attention to and that we should be organizing against Pride. We should be organizing protests. We should be having conversations with Pride councils. We should be saying that the bare minimum, it has not been met across almost most Prides. Even there are some prides that are start that are either acknowledging the genocide but not divesting, and then others who are divesting but not acknowledging the genocide. And it's like you can't not build a world of fascism if you're not even willing to acknowledge genocide and divest from genocide, let alone begin redistributing resources and things like that. And so just something for people to keep in mind. It's something that I'll be talking about a little bit more over social media in the coming weeks, uh, just out of necessity and but just something for people to pay attention to because we're already seeing police brutality increasing, which also means that people need to be checking in on the queer and trans black community more so Mm -hmm. because ultimately we know who ends up killed by the police when that happens. And so it's just a lot for people to reflect on, um, uh, but just inviting people to be a part of any and all of it and um, to really move beyond that bare minimum. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, pride is such a sticky subject. Uh, and just anecdotally, our, our like corporate pride uh, here in Asheville uh, recently uh, divested from Pratt & Whitney, which is a subsidiary of Raytheon. Mm. Um, but it was like pulling teeth. You know, it was not a not an easy. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they're like divesting from the police. It doesn't mean that they're supporting like black and brown and trans communities it does not mean that it just means that this very very crucial but also like we shouldn't stop there when uh happened and that's that's it but yeah that's really really like i think that's a really good provocation moving into pride season and as people who are queer and trans and as people who are like in and of those communities we should be like focusing on that yeah. Um, and there are so many like grassroots, non-pride, queer, trans organizations that are doing stuff all around the world. Yafa, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to get to sit down with you. And please um, let us know if we can be like of use amplifying any endeavors or uh, amplifying any voices that you'd like to put us in touch with. Like we're available for that and very eagerly available for that. Amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay, or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf support. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. Programming support is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm is a bookstore and social movement space owned by its workers in operation since 2008. Their event calendar and complete catalog of books can be found online at firestorm.coop.